Here we go. Sounds good. All right. So um, today we have Dark Trace Cybersecurity uh, with on the Data Friday with us to talk about their product and kind of how their their system is built and what all the it means from a industry standpoint and and just generally kind of give us their sales pitch and stuff. So um, as a general as a general commentary, this stuff is really really fascinating and it, it's obviously turned into like a big uh, big industry. Uh, worldwide. So, and I think everything from government agency to corporations are interested in this stuff. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll give it to Oliver and, and Alex to kind of give the overview and, and discuss what they're doing. Awesome. So I, I hope you can all see the slide. Yep. On your screen. Awesome. So, so really we're going to talk to you today a little bit about how dark trace is really operationalized machine learning, you know, things which a lot of people tend to see in academia and the lab. We started running in the real world. A uh, little bit about me. First of all, I'm not a data scientist. My own background is uh, in cybersecurity. I started out, you know, what, what I guess some people call an ethical hacker, then moved over to the side in stopping unethical hackers. Um, I also worked at Gartner um, for almost four years where I covered various security topics. And I guess a tie in for me into this is I'm not a data scientist, but it was my job to evaluate data science driven products and how suitable they were for actual security practitioners. And I worked at a company called Tenable and I managed a data science team there where we did data mining based on telemetry from people doing security work. And we published reports which ended up in Forbes, Wall Street Journal and so on. So I basically I managed a team of data scientists. Um, yeah. So uh, Alex will just give you a quick overview of the company. Yeah, sure. So uh, there are data scientists behind this. Uh, we do have about 30 PhDs in the UK uh, that founded us back in 2013 alongside former heads of cybersecurity uh, from MI5 and GCHQ. So GCHQ is the UK's equivalent of the NSA. Uh, so we're rooted with uh, a pretty solid background there and, and strong founders, and they were just seeing that uh, in the cyberspace, the legacy tools and approaches of using firewalls, antiviruses, definitions of known bad uh, just didn't work. Um, and as you know, we're using Teams right now and in the current environment, the expanding perimeter for Teams to defend was just, um, you know, becoming impossible for security teams to keep up with. So uh, we've seen some pretty massive growth here in the company, and I think that uh, as an interest to data scientists, we have a nice blend of starting with unsupervised machine learning to use network traffic uh, and build out what we call patterns of life. Um, but basically what that is, is just using uh, peer groups and uh, some modeling on seeing what users, devices, the network as a whole is doing, and then spotting anomalies. And from there, spotting the anomalies, that transitions over to our cyber AI analysts, which Oliver will go a little deeper into today. Uh, and that cyber AI analyst uses the supervised machine learning to simulate uh, an investigation of our own uh, cyber threat analyst that we have about 100 around the world. Awesome. So, so just to give you a bit of an oversight, so really, you know, we're going to show you the product, but really I, I, I gathered some data just so that we can explain to you how does this work, you know, in high level. Also, what are some of the design principles that have driven how we've built it. I mean, so first of all, you know, we use stream processing. It's for speed. In parallel, we're looking at raw packets, which really goes into into a, I would say, a, a rolling buffer. We look, we keep the data on average for about 30 minutes, and we wait for an anomaly to happen. But we also have various different types of data. You know, basically statistics, telemetry. We still put into a relational database. Unstructured data, we put into an unstructured database. Really, I would say the best method for the best. Uh, you know, the best suited method for the data at hand. Um, we also use multiple ML models, and there's a simple reason. There's no single model that's going to solve every single security use case. Quite the opposite. We need a ton of different model types uh, and ML implementations, algorithms to be able to solve various different challenges that come together when you're trying to detect attackers. Um, yeah, and I suspect you probably have an ML model to select which ML model to use. That indeed, that's a recursive Bayesian mathematics. If you yeah. think about Bayes, you know, it's basically always looking at the most likely, the most probable and recursive because we're constantly, constantly looking at it again and again. 
Um, one way to explain it is that you have this sea of possibilities and the Bayes picks out the ones which are most likely. Yeah. And that's really what's going on on the back end. There's, there's a whole lot of just data lying there and being processed and there's tons of outcomes, but we need some way of determining which ones are indeed, you know, the most probable ones to look at. And more importantly, we have to do this at scale. We have to do it in real time. I mean, so when we look in at our field, in f our field, that's called uh, in the pharmaceutical and clinical trials, it's called risk based monitoring is what's called. Oh, OK, I, you know, that's actually from a cybersecurity point of view. I, right now, over the last couple of years, the move has been towards something similar. It used to be very much focused on a, it used to be a numbers game. You know, how many did, how many things have I detected this month, which has absolutely no bearing on, on anything. And if you look at how in cybersecurity in general, we used to evaluate severity or criticality, really, it never looked at the, the risk. It generally looked at the impact. Because mm -hmm. risk is risk is basically it's based on probability and frequency. Yeah, you know? which executives hate to hear that there's scenarios that you don't cover. They want to know that everything is covered all the time. So when you start talking about probabilistic, you know, selectivity around resources and, and analysis, then it starts making them nervous. But when you start throwing out terms like risk-based monitoring and Bayesian analysis, then they, all of a sudden they're okay with only covering the big stuff. It, absolutely, and, and this, but you're absolutely right. When you talk in terms of probabilities for a business, they want something actionable. Yeah. They want something that's yes. They want 100 percent. Exactly, and of course, so there has to be a translation between these two different mindsets at some point as well. But um, if we look at the design principles behind how we did this, and keeping in mind that the original designers have an intelligence background, yeah. one of the first principles it it must learn the normal self. Essentially, we're doing a form of baselining, but we're not doing it just based on statistics. We're not just doing it based on a couple of dimensions or characteristics, but across really over around a thousand different characteristics and in various different ways. It has to understand complex patterns of life. And this, this, this pattern of life, it's actually from, from an intelligence service background. When they're profiling, let's say, a terrorist, they start outlining the patterns of life of that terrorist. What we're trying to establish is when they deviate, because it might indicate that yeah. they're going to do something soon. And so we've applied a similar principle. But yeah, we have just because you're from a certain background, a certain area, does not necessarily mean you're going to be a terrorist. It's when you all of a sudden show an interest in taking flying lessons and, you know, not landing lessons. Uh, not all of a sudden you're going to flag. Yeah, and then, so we do this for devices, for, for people, basically users, but also all of the relationships between these. They, they can be quite complex, you know. Um, the other aspect is that we don't have good data. We have no process where we're able to clean up the data. We have to deal with what's coming in as it is. And so from a data scientist point of view, that, that's hell, right? Normally you want to be able to clean the data so that you can, you can uh, stand behind it. We're unable to. Whatever some technology device throws out, whatever a user does, we have to be able to deal with that. It's, a, it's an inherently noisy world, we say, but really it's an erratic world. Machines are slightly better than people, you know, it's a little bit more standardized, but then we have just a pure diversity of different operating systems, programming languages, different protocols and so on, which actually makes that quite complex. Um, people are erratic by default. They just, you know, users never do what you want them to do. And we also have to be <laughs> like able fill to- fill out everything. planned hours and work front tasks. Yeah, so we have to plan that in with it as well. The other aspect is that it has to be easy enough to understand even by non-specialists. So we avoid too heavy security language because we have people using this, for example, in the Navy uh, on board a ship. And they don't necessarily yeah. have high-end cybersecurity skills if they have a bunch of other different hats that they're wearing. So we focus on explaining what something is doing. It's not about classification. We're not saying this is ransomware X, Y, Z. We're saying this is what this host is doing, and that's suspicious. Yeah. 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 The, the other aspect is longevity. Coming back to that Navy example, uh, our, our technology runs on submarines and power stations. They're air gapped. They might not come back to us for years. We hand the appliance off, we don't see it again. So it has to be able to really run by itself over years and years without any kind of updates. No signature, no threat intelligence. Well, I mean, the, the advantage there, though, is that they're not exactly getting system updates and anything or, 
during that time period, right? Like they're not, how connected are those things to a network, right? Um, if it's security systems or a nuclear power station, not at all. They're air gapped by design. The security principle, you don't allow any kind of external access to it because an attacker could use it. And if you look at, uh, I think one of the more famous examples is Stuxnet in Iran. They managed to bypass the air gap by various other means of getting the malware in there. So even is that then, the one where they dropped the USB drives in the parking lots and then just hoped that somebody would plug it into their? Yeah, that, that's. <laughs> I, I read about. I read about that. That was uh, pretty clever by the CIA to do that one. Yeah, and, and you know, and it must work on commodity hardware technology. We can't deploy a very expensive, purpose-built data science stack. It has yeah. to be able to run on something like VMware or on standard Intel architecture. So and it has to be really low processor intensive, really low memory intensive, really uh, yeah. just mindless execution. Highly optimized is, yeah. is what I would say our secret <laughs> sauce is being able to scale it up, right? Where, yeah. where, where yeah. a lot of our, so a lot of vendors in the industry do this in the cloud. They don't do it yeah. on a small box in someone's environment. And uh, it must operate in near real time. It's pointless being told you've been hit by ransomware half an hour after the fact. Uh, yeah. Too late. Yeah. So, so these are all, I would say, we say design principles. In reality, they're constraints. Mm -hmm. These yeah. are things we have to take on board. We have to be able to address as well. Uh, if we look at the actual data, you know, so it's uh, raw, it's messy, and it's, it also has to be future proof. New stuff is coming out, new stuff is being designed. But right now, we have about a thousand different features, characteristics that we're actually putting into various models. And these, you know, strictly saying it's observations, you know, what is happening, metrics, so how much data is being transferred, and inferences. Inferences is the important one. We have to be able to infer certain things because we don't have full data, full knowledge. We might not see the whole thing end to end. So a lot of this is basically trying to extrapolate based on seeing half of what you need to see and then knowing what are the potential possibilities that they could be doing and assigning a likelihood to it. And on okay. the right hand side. It looks like just reading through the list over here, it looks like a lot of these are really low level networking, you know, level items. So it, like, yeah. you know, multicasts and DNS requests and and uh, you mentioned packets earlier, so I assume like some of the packet details, packet size, time to live, stuff like that. And uh, further than that, we also do SCADA, industrial control systems. We do IoT, and it all goes into the same underlying, I would say, universal stream. And we use the yeah. model then to, to pick out the individual components. But uh, you can put any kind of data into it. From our point of view, yeah. it doesn't really matter. Yeah. So I assume that it, it just starts to identify the different objects that are in the network and the different uh, different types of you know actors in the in the system, and then just tries to identify where the relationships. And then when it sees uncomfortable, I would say patterns or connections between them, then it starts to flag or raise up the the priority of the concern or the I risk. Yeah, I, I mean, what we essentially do initially is we run a baseline, right? Uh, and yeah. uh, and the nice thing is about that is that it takes only about seven days with network data. It's quite noisy. There's a lot of data to gather. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. but 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 it's some things aren't quite clear. And I'll give you a good example. Like malware does command and control. It has to connect back to the internet to pick up commands from the operator. Yeah. Well, a VPN client also constantly has small connections back to a VPN server and the chat app on the Volkswagen website does too. And so that one thing, obviously it's not enough to be able to say, well, this is abnormal. So we yeah. have to look really, I would say, in, 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 uh, across very different um, groupings. And really the way that we do this, we have millions of detectors. Online and batch, we do comparison to prior behavior. So what has this system done in the past? And then we have the additional dimensions. So we do clustering, different peer groups based on behavior, yeah. based on how the, the application looks and so on. And then we start comparing to all of these peer groups, then to adjacent peer groups, and then also to the company as a whole. And the reason for that is quite simple. We don't want to learn bad. If we deploy this into a network and there's already yeah. a resident threat, well, we'd learn it if we only looked at it in one or two dimensions. Yeah, you're so just going to classify it as one of your clusters. That's normal baseline. 
and then it's just going to sit there and continue to operate a, a, as normal. So I assume like it, it'll it'll flag you know things that it thinks, and then you still need an operator or somebody who's familiar with the with the on premises like expectations of what their systems do to kind of go through it and kind of double check the clusters and double check the specific items that pop up. Like I, I, you might classify thing as risk or high or low, but they're still going to have to like kind of look at it a little bit. Indeed, I mean, so we have some full autonomous stuff, and I'll show you that in the demo in a minute. But um, even there, um, I would say the biggest problem we have is trust. I, yeah. I, I, my, my argument is that people need to learn to trust the black box, because because the attackers will. They're not yeah. funny about it, you know. At the same time, if you if your prerequisite is that a security person can understand it, we're limited by their knowledge of data science. That can't yeah. be. So building up trust, making it very transparent, being letting people know what's going on as far as we can without, I would say, confusing them without needing a PhD in mathematics is a, is a really big... <laughs> and I, do, what do you I, laugh? I laugh because this is a problem every data science team has. Is And it's not specific to security, right? Like, even in, you know, even in the, you know, pharma world, right? Like if you start to use data science to identify new, you know, chemical compound components, right? Um, you're still, you still run into this bar of, you know, well, yeah, but how did that occur? And so if you run into an executive or, or a mid-level manager that's not comfortable or doesn't understand how the math works, sometimes they'll say, well, you know, we have a tried and true method. We'll stick with that, you know, and so it kind of gets pooped on. Um, so, so that's, you're, you're describing your, why, what makes your sales pitch so difficult. And it's the same problem every data science product has essentially, which is you can only teach people what they're willing to learn and, and want to accept. So, so yeah, it's fascinating that you run into that. <laughs> I, I think especially when you're starting to, to do this practically and, and the security industry, look, we're all focused on risk. We're cynical by default. Yeah. Oftentimes you're liable for it. It's your job yeah. on the hook if something goes wrong. And in the past, we've tried doing auto autonomous blocking and stuff. It just failed on the fidelity of, of the detection. A lot of false positives, and immediately the business would say, switch yeah. it off, you know? Yeah, turn it off. Exactly. Turn so off the virus where it's, it's impacting the performance on the server. Yeah. And, and, and so we kind of hit that point where we have to almost, this, this I would say, learned helplessness, we have to start overcoming. And that's really by being about as transparent and open as we can with, what, with what's being done. We have an app for mobile. It's not really used by the practitioners. It's rather for the managers so that they can look and see what's happening. It's all of that transparency and trust building there. And, uh, but at the same time, there are security challenges that are going to require, you know, basically ML, AI-driven approaches, partially because they just stress what a human can do. One example would be, you know, if you imagine an attack, I'm not sure how familiar people are with a kill chain, but it's this abstraction of what an attacker has to do to succeed. They have to somehow gain access, then they have to be able to get better privileges so that they can do what they need to do. And ultimately, they're going to be trying to exfiltrate data. They're going to be looking at getting out that, that list of uh, customers that they've hacked you for or whatever. Now, once you're at the point where they're starting to upload this file, if you go through a manual process, it's too late. By the time you've, you've enacted your manual process, the data's gone. They've already got the file, yeah. Exactly. So, so in other words, you have to be really quick there, and that's something where you need to do it autonomously. Machine speed attacks like ransomware, ransomware takes seconds. Somebody downloads a file, it starts scanning the network, it opens every single file that it can find and encrypts it. If you're doing a manual process, it's not instant response, it's disaster recovery, right? You'll be in the news. Yeah. And so you need to be able to have something that's just just as quick. And our, our, our messaging around this is that it's for, it's for machine versus machine fight here. Yeah. That's essentially it. The other one is known unknowns. Traditionally in, his, in, in security, we have relied on signatures. Basically, you know what a specific malware looks like. You can identify a pattern and you look for that pattern in the network traffic. That's how most virus, you know, virus scan software works. Exactly. But the problem, of course, is that they constantly change. Even the same malware can be um, basically compiled and compressed differently to give it a different look. You can XOR it very easily. So the problem is that using that approach, it's very effective for precision. But what we need in most cases is accuracy. 
we need to know an attack is going on. I'm not interested in which specific attack. And more importantly, most attacks, well, all attacks, have similar um, what we call tactics, techniques, and procedures. Like, as I just mentioned, an attacker has to get access. So they send an email to someone which will exploit their web, uh, sorry, their mail client. From there, they're going to have to start getting better rights because the user they hacked is an admin. Once they have admin, they start to need maybe get into the next network because there's a firewall in the way. These actions yeah. are always very, I mean, they differ in the sequence and how many you need for different attacks, but they are always there. And of course, if you look at the actions, you look at what it's doing rather than what it is, you can detect known unknowns. We know all attacks look like this. Even if we yeah. don't know the specific attack, we can still you know, detect these attacks in general. It's a bit frustrating for security people. Humans want to know what something is. We have an urge for it. And there's a place for that. But not when you're trying to stop something breaching you. You can do that afterwards when you're doing forensics. The machine doesn't need to know. <laughs> so, it, but it gives you this advantage of not needing to have seen something in advance to be able to stop it. Um, the other aspect is limited no stretch resources. Um, there's a shortfall of cybersecurity expert of, depending on who you ask, one to three million worldwide. That's never going to be filled. Like most countries, you know, if I look at the UAE, for example, something like uh, Qatar, they have a population yeah. of 300,000. And they need that population for the army, for the intelligence services, for the government. There just aren't going to be enough people to do this. So automation is the right way to go. And the last aspect is 24 seven coverage. Running a 24 by seven, if you want to follow health and safety, you have two basically bodies on a seat. Every point you need 10 to 12 people. That doesn't include staff turnover, holidays or anything. The average retention span of a junior analyst in a security operations center is 18 months. Then they move into more senior roles. And so basically if you're not running at 24 seven or only in certain regions, why not switch this to fully autonomous outside of business hours? What's, it's not going to be a user who's going to be blocked. And so these are all things where we basically need a higher level of, uh, I would say, intelligence, you know, to be able to actually solve these problems. Now, the way that, uh, that our platform is built up, and there's already a newer one of this because we have a host agent coming out in the second half of the year, but really we have these different components. You know, at the top we have this, it's basically a, a, what we call a cyber AI platform. And yeah. underneath that we have the enterprise immune system. That's what does the baselining, the anomaly detection. We have Darktrace Antigena. That's another, um, another engine on top, a different machine learning approach to be able to do the autonomous response, which is really looking at all of these different model breaches and is determining when should I respond and block a connection. And Originally, when we started out, we only did network data. You know, our founders, intelligence background, say network is the yeah. only source of truth. And we don't want to rely on a third party system like an intrusion detection system. We want to see it ourselves. Yeah, yeah it's a plus, it's the foundation of the entire thing, right? So, in theory, everything else is going through the network anyway. So, if you're looking at the network data components, you should be able to identify the emails going through, anyways. But but if you've already got, I can see why you would start layering that other stuff in, because if you've got the data associated with the metadata for the emails, then include it in your model. It's another data point. Indeed. And what we're trying to achieve is a high level of confidence that what we're seeing is malicious. Yeah. And the more data points we can add to it, and especially because some attacks will originate on the Internet, but they will go into the internal network and then out into the SaaS application. And if you think about trying to do autonomous response, we want to have granular control. We want to basically contain it where it's most effective, minimizes the amount of damage and operational impact. So the more we go into other areas, the more the higher confidence we can build up because we can basically triangulate these different data points, correlate them. And at yeah. the same time, we're going to have more granular control over where we actually contain it to uh, make sure that a business doesn't, you know, get uh, basically have a, I would say a loss of integrity in the business operation. Yeah. I and mean, it's a balance you guys kind of have to have to keep right is with all security where, you know, you have to balance the operational effectiveness of the organization you, you, it, while, while maintaining the security. So you don't want to, you don't want to do the most secure thing, which would be just shut it all down. 
right? Um, you want them to be able to continue to, to, you know, operate. But at the same time, you want to maintain the fact that those those uh, systems are processing. So in a banking system, like the worst thing that could ever happen, you know, when I was at like MasterCard, we had this happen a couple of times where something would get flagged and then a server would get shut down or, or uh, basically put into like a containment. And, and as a result, payment transactions start to fail. And uh, that's like money out the door for those guys. So how do you guys strike that balance? I guess is kind of what my question is. You were kind of sort of leading up to it, I think. I mean, so, so, so on the one hand, as I said, we use a, a different uh, machine learning approach to do that specifically. Um, yeah. I bet the, the greatest analogy there is that we basically, Antigena is just sat there dreaming. And looking, you know, dreaming different possibilities and always evaluating which one should I respond to right now? Is this worth responding to based on thresholds? But we also focus on essentially, I would say, what are called meta models there. We have models which analyze the other models to determine that there's a high, you know, to basically say this is definitely ransomware, not just some person. Because my, my favorite real world example when I was working at Gartner was a company who was using a anomaly detection-based system, NetFlow, so only about, what, I think 30 or 40 different attributes that they were measuring. And it was very one-dimensional, and it ran great for seven months. Last day of the financial year, they used to transfer a huge file to their auditor. It only happens once a year. It got yeah. blocked. Yeah. It got blocked. Because it was a completely anomalous event that only happens once a, once a year. So the system thought something funky was going on and then autonomously blocked it. So what was the reaction in the company? Because that is exactly the type of event that makes them say, okay, well, this isn't working. Shut it off. Exactly. Like at the executive level, that's, that's when a, a CTO or a, you know, a CSO or somebody comes in and, and says, like, listen, we paid you for this stuff and you're, you're breaking our business. So how do you mitigate that kind of risk to your business? I mean, so, so on the one hand, um, we, are, we have background models which run around tagging stuff based yeah. on what kind of a system it is, trying to work out how risky is this device. We also give the ability for end users to adjust these weightings. We give them the choice of whitelisting addresses, and that would have been the right, that would have been the right, yeah. I would say, solution in that case. If they would have whitelisted if they had their known orders of address, yeah. well, they knew, but the vendor, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, the security vendor didn't. But it was so <laughs> uncommon for them, they also didn't think about it. It only happens once a year. I'm not even sure if the engineers, you know, it could have been set up 10 years ago and, and it's just running every year. Um, but but ultimately, like, we try to avoid that. And the other aspect is that we, uh, we're we very granular. You can say these type of incidents, these type of model breaches, these type of thresholds, high level yeah. of confidence, you know. But there's always a bit of risk involved that um, it, it depends a little bit on your risk appetite. And the yeah. other, I would say the other trickiness is that it's quite ambiguous because in security, a lot of what we do is policy driven. I'll give you an example. In one company, Dropbox might be absolutely forbidden. In another company, one team might be allowed to use it. We can't know that. That's a policy decision. The company has determined that. And so they have to be a little bit, um, I would say, if you have really complex policies, they need to start making sure that that's also expressed in how we help them configure the actual solution. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I, mean, I think most I, mean, I think most people that have worked in any type of like IT security environment are familiar with, you know, the risks associated with various policy setups. So that's a pretty, pretty well known, you know, risk anytime you're kind of configuring any sort of security software. I mean, and, and ultimately, we, we also have this this in between mode autonomous, uh, sorry, a human confirmation mode. And if you imagine you can automate yeah. uh, the detection, even the action. But it will go to a person who says yes, no. Yeah, I mean, it's the same kind of model that the banks all use now associated with risk monitoring on, on banking transactions. So, like, if, if all of a sudden, you know, I'm in Pennsylvania, as a general rule, if all of a sudden they start seeing charges out of Ohio for my credit cards, they're going to give me a phone call. And they'll probably let the transaction go through if it's under a certain dollar amount. But if it's, like, over a certain dollar amount, they have a risk profile and they, they call me first before they agree to it. There's also a buffer in, in banking transactions of like three days too to action it. 
you guys don't have that kind of window to to act on that human approval model, right? So is the expectation in this kind of situation that there is a live group sitting sitting on, you know, sitting there watching this stuff? Because I assume it has to be within minutes. So so, so I, I would say that if, if it's uh, in reality, it depends a little bit on how much data we have. Typical ransomware, we can, we can respond quick enough because it is so obvious when you see it happening, the steps. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If it, you see, if it, you, you all, obviously, you're going to see that start to encrypt things on the network. So yeah. As soon as that happens, that's gonna got to be the biggest trigger. And exactly. I, so, so those kind of things, we can. Uh, there's a high level of uh, confidence in the in the detection, so we yeah. can go fully autonomous. It's more, I would say, it's more the insider threat stuff where there's more ambiguity. An upset sales rep that's downloading your customer database, kind of thing. If it if it uh, if it looks pretty normal um, and it just deviates slightly, we wouldn't suggest automating it fully unless you have a stringent security requirement like a bank right um, for example or let's say a law company that's where the risk of blocking it wrongly outweighs the risk of not blocking it at all yeah, yeah we had, sorry, we had a client service out. rep when we were, we were, I was working at a financial services company and we had a, a rep that had about you know 15,000 you know clients or whatnot and those clients belong to the financial services company not to that rep so there was a trigger in place in that company that if if they saw the printer start to print pages of a doc a document more than 100 pages it would immediately shut down their printer they basically they weren't allowed to print more than 100 pages and then and then somebody would have to review it to make sure that they weren't just printing off their client list now this is like 17 years ago right when when people were still printing things but but uh, they had that manual trigger in place on all of their stuff. Um, so it's fascinating that you guys have almost a similar model <laughs> on some of this. I think the principles and the constraints the principles are the same. Similar. Yeah. And that, you know, but, but in the end, what we really have all together here then is, is you know, it's what we, the self defending digital business. But our analogy is the yeah. immune system. Because the immune yeah. system has a good idea of what's normal and it has essentially antibodies, probes, which go and check. Is this normal? And if not, they trigger an alert and then they, they start, you know, basically uh, triggering the immune system. And so we have a very similar analogy to it. Um, in cybernetics terms, we're looking at feedback loops, right? Yeah. And, and that, that's, of course, uh, but also very similar to the immune system in a very real sense. But really what we focus on, it's detecting anomalous behavior, enforcing benign behavior, and the other thing where we've applied some ML is automating triage. So what a first line analyst would normally do in a security uh, team is go through all of these different alerts and say, hmm, this one looks interesting. That one actually doesn't look so interesting. We've already applied machine learning to solve that problem too. And so really the autonomous response, you know, it's a surgical interruption of attacks. And what I mean by that is we don't block the entire host. If you have someone sitting on a PC and they're infected with malware, we want to block the malware, not the person going about their work. Anything that that person normally does, they will still be allowed to do. But the malware trying to phone home, that's the connection we will try to block. It has to be quick. We respond every three seconds. That's kind of the cycle, of the, the near real time delay, if you so want. And it has or shouldn't have any impact on normal, legitimate activity. We try to reestablish business as usual. That's what we're trying to do really in, in a nutshell. And of course, it's about proportionate response. So uh, the way that we do it, we understand and enforce the patterns of life. If it's a normal pattern of life for you, you can carry on doing it. If not, that's when we act. Um, we try to do it not just on an individual basis, but for the whole organization. That's these are multiple different, I would say, tiers, layers that we keep looking at dimensions. And of course, it has to self-generate according to the environment. We can't just train it in a lab and deploy it in the user's environment. They're all different. Yeah. So it has to learn there. And of course, it has to sell. So you have the entire training feedback loop uh, model generation system, essentially just completely built into your, your agent that is installed on the client. So either on the PCs and on the or on the servers or, or what? That's that's another question. So where is your where are your agents installed? Pretty much oh. everywhere. So ideally, we would want access to a core switch on the spanel mirror port. If okay. you're looking at Amazon AWS, we'd use the virtual tap. 
If you're looking at a SaaS, we will be using the API connector. So it depends. Yeah. But, but the most effective place is, of course, a core switch. And from there, we should be able to see everything. If you have multiple switches, we just deploy multiple probes. And I, I think the beauty of it there is the fact that it's not a you know big install. Um, I've actually been out and helped with an install myself where we actually plug in a black box into a server room, set up the span session, and from the span session without any agents, just looking at the network traffic, we actually build out the types of devices connecting. Um, and so specifically when considering agent versus agent list, which we trend towards the agent list, um, like lots of IoT devices that are connecting, uh, people bringing their own iPhones. Uh, there's just IT teams usually underestimate by 20% of the amount of devices connecting to their network. Yeah. So so so. So is it so is it a physical device and some data centers, and then and then I assume on the cloud it's a it's a software device that you're connecting. It's not a just a client software that you install. No, no. I, I mean, so the actual I would say the brain is an appliance or a virtual image. Uh, yeah. And that's the way to deploy. But um, the reason why we're bringing out a host agent is because people have satellite offices with five or six people. You're not yeah. going to deploy a big appliance there. No. So we're going to be able to install a, an agent on, on someone's PC in that network, and they will basically act as a probe for us. Gotcha. You know, that's a good model because then it also helps you kind of protect your proprietary software as well. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. But uh, once again, coming back to the original use case of nuclear power stations and submarines, yeah, makes perfect yeah. sense. You know, uh, it, it has to be. They will just put it into the server rack, and they have a server rack on a submarine. That's where it will go. At the core switch of the submarine. That's got to cause some concern. I, I, I just imagine a security guy like that you're trying to sell this to, and you say, "Listen, all we have to do is take this black box that we can't tell you what's in it." And we're going to hook it up to your network in, a, in, in the central location at the, at the center of everything that matters to your company. But, and but, uh, trust us, it's going to solve this problem. But, but, it, but the, the beauty is that we don't need to connect to it. Yeah. So at least they have ultimate control over what, what, you know, what the box does. If they don't yeah, want to yeah, yeah. let it out to the internet, they don't have to. And at that point, it kills us too. We couldn't do anything with it. But you're right. It's, that's why we have to be very transparent in terms of being able to provide an audit trail to show a little bit what's yeah. going on there. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and there has to be a lot of trust and integrity in the company. Like obviously if the company ever is brought into question as far as their 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 allegiances to either specific governments or agencies or corporations, you're gonna lose that that market, that opposition market associated with that. It's so yeah, there's a lot of as with all security companies, right? Yeah, there's a lot of trust involved. Um, but, but uh, you know, we generally do a, a proof of value. We will give out the appliance for a month for free to let people trial it during that month. Yeah. After one week one, we sit down with them. We show them what's happened. And I'll be honest, our success criteria for us is finding something they didn't know they had. Yeah, we had a guy, uh, I always get told the story by the guys at NRG that like they had a security firm come in and um, they connected to the Wi-Fi in the coffee shop and then scanned the company's network through there and they were able to like pull up their photographs on their network share from uh from the holiday party and it was one of those things where like how we thought we had a secure system and you're able to pull up our holiday photos on our network share and i think that's a really powerful sales tool for any kind of security company so the fact that you guys can do that uh and, and do that little quick proof of concept. It's pretty powerful. Oh, we bank on it, and we pay the cost, right? We're yeah. giving them. We have. Yeah, we have no, no, you're eating involved. that demo cost. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so so the other the other neat thing that we've done is the cyber AI analyst. So really, you know, it, it's a, to, to to put it short, it's basically a machine learning implementation supervised that uh, essentially does this triage act. Now show that. In the, in the demo in a minute as well. But what's interesting is that it, it's supervised learning. We, yep. for the past three years, have monitored our own analysts. We just have over just over 100 analysts where we offer a service around this. Every click, every investigation, every hunting exercise, every report that they wrote, and we fed it into a machine learning engine. Now, what it actually does is it conducts basically a survey of all of the model breaches based on what it learned from looking at our 100 plus analysts. 
then it outlines the typical sequences that a human would have identified. And what's interesting, 92% faster on average than a human. And the irony here, what I find incredibly funny, is that some of our analysts panicked. They thought they were training their replacement. But <laughs> of course they did. Every but single time you introduce an AI or an ML, like in automation, people think they're losing their jobs. We're an AI company. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do, you know, but uh, it's not what we've done is we've reduced the time it takes from about 90 minutes to about 10 to 15 minutes because yeah. we still have a human in the loop. Yeah, um, and it just increases the capacity of their ability to keep things done. It, it, indeed. Yeah. And, and of course, we don't want to completely let let the ML do it. We're still training it. If there's new new type of threats, we still need people to do it so that it keeps on learning so that we can scale it. Um, the other interesting thing is that last month, 80% of our written reports were written by it. For a year, we started sending it out to customers and salespeople to see if they'd and notice they the difference. It it can even, <laughs> and it even spits it out in Japanese. It supports five <laughs> different languages. There's no template, no configuration, nothing like that. It's just a machine learning model. Yeah. That's great. And so, and so uh, I think this is where we're going to jump into the demo. You got uh, uh, probably about... 12 minutes and then that, we'll do a little oh, that, couple questions that's fine i mean so 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 this is the dark trace um here we go this is our interface i hope you can see it it should be up on the browser uh, yep it's coming here we go now the first thing you'll notice is that is the ux was designed by game designers yeah it looks like a video game and it's uh i you know not not ironically i guess uh, very dark uh, well, it, it, you know, if you ever done a night shift in a security operation center, you don't I want this white screen looking at you, you know? No, but, you don't but, want to look yeah. at a white screen all night. Yeah. But what's nice is that generally the warmer the color, the more risk there is, the more anomalous stuff we found. And of course, if you're an international company, you want to know about your international spread. Once you go into here, oh. we start looking at all of the different groups, right? And as I said, the warmer something is, the more suspicious something has occurred there. And this goes right down essentially to a uh, to, to a network level. And the best way I can show you this, if you kind of look here, this is actually your assets there. We have the IP address, we have the MAC address, the vendor, if we can identify it. We're telling you if we have autonomous response enabled on yeah. it and controlled. And down here, the model breaches. And uh, to give you a bit of an example of one, if we look at here, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so that we can all see it better on the screen. What yeah. you can see here is basically we detected a host, host name, danger host XYZ. That's suspicious. It's a rare domain. So basically no one else in the company is using it. No one in your peer group is using it. And right afterwards, there was, you know, basically we, we have uh, one to Monero as well. So this is kind of like where it's already starting to stack for different probabilities. And interestingly enough, we can go into this. And here you see the outline visually very nicely. This is based on all of these different model breaches related to this one host. And you can see it's doing a scan, it's connecting outside. So even visually, if you're starting to plot this. Yeah, it looks suspicious. It looks suspicious immediately, right? Yeah. Um, so this is the, uh, the other thing that we, of course, can do. We can do it based on the devices. And here then you already have a summary of diff uh, basically of one user and their device and all of the different suspicious stuff that happened. So here we have someone who logged into SAS, viewed some resources there, unusual administrator files accessed because we know because no other administrator accesses these, unusual yeah. country for the login, and there you can already see all of the machine learning Attem models. Attempt to add it, edit Etsy hosts. Yeah, and then we have an anomalous connection, which is basically SMB, that's file sharing on Windows. We have- Connecting back to Russia. Yeah. And so, so and these are all very individual models, right? We can tune the weighting on all of these. We can uh, basically yeah. adjust various parameters. But of course, what we're really here for is to look at two very different things. This is AI analyst. And you just saw all of these different red things at the bottom, right? Well, yeah. this is where the AI analyst has gone into it and has started doing triage. And at the top, you can basically see all of these different events here. We have the different red dots. We have the timeline and we have every single one of the breaches completely described. The device was observed making an SSL connection to the rare external endpoint and it tells you the endpoint. Moreover, the SSL fingerprint associated with a connection was only used for a limited set of endpoints. And so there's a whole lot of uh, um, machine learning. So did the analyst it. actually write that summary? Yes. 
based on reading reports that humans wrote. Nice. And on the right hand, if you, you click through, here's the entire series of events. There's the next step. So after it did this SSL command and control traffic, it started doing a TCP port scan on the network, trying to find other systems, other open ports. Then you see it writes of suspicious files. So what we're seeing here is actually ransomware. Yeah. Then it starts doing, and if you look at the time here that it took, it did not take long. This happened within a minute, all of these different yeah. actions. And of course, at the bottom, we always throw in which files were written, the file name of the actual file, destination device, the size of the file. The sizes can differ because attackers will compress files to, to get them across the network to confuse more simple systems, right? And lastly, we have the possible HTTP command and control. And when we, what we also do, I mentioned the kill chain earlier. That on the left hand side is for kill chain. Initial infection, established foothold, privilege escalation, internal reconnaissance, lateral movement, accomplished mission. And we can see exactly which steps. Yeah, there's your process flow for how a ransomware works, basically. Uh, absolutely. And like I said, this is completely, so there's no script here, there's no configuration, there's no template. This is based on a uh, very deep learning supervised machine learning. It's nice. It's yeah. Very nice. And because this is a device that sits adjacent essentially to the network, even though it looks like you just have an insane amount of details here, all of this data is actually pulled out of the packets on the network traffic. So there's no impact either to the client or the host. Basically, the two devices that are talking to each other associated with this, neither one of them are going to see any impact associated with this type of analysis and monitoring. Uh, it's, absolutely. Pretty, it's pretty slick. I, I mean, so, and the reason like we had a, we had a customer who said, or a prospect driver who said, if I have 30 minutes on a Friday afternoon, what can you do for me? And this is the result. It, this is not, it does not triage everything. It will always surface the most yeah. interesting, most critical things that are going on so that you can action them. That's basically what this is doing. It's not doing a complete triage in the sense that it's prioritizing every single thing. It's surfacing the ones which need looking at based on what a human would also pick. No, yeah, this is this is pretty slick. And uh, and of course, the, the other aspect where we're doing pretty heavy uh, uh, heavy machine learning is antigena. As I mentioned earlier, essentially, if you imagine what it's doing, it, it is always looking at um uh, at what's going on right now, what looks completely suspicious and out of the ordinary. And indeed, you can see here, it just blocked connections to port 445, which is, which is once again, Windows file sharing. That's blocking ransomware. Yeah. And on, on the, we can say block. They're blocked the connection to the telnet port. And, you, and, you that. and what we can set up here yeah. is, of course, how long you do it for. You, if you don't want to block someone out completely, you can just set a, a, a block window onto that. Yeah, so it slows down any sort of automated attacks, but doesn't shut down a user completely. Uh, absolutely, but but I, I guess another way of looking at this, of course, is also the fact that um, we're also doing the uh, sorry the blocking. And let me open this up because then uh, I can show you this here as well, because of course we also have a, a fair amount of. Now uh, this is where you see, this is also where you see that that ransomware example that AI analyst found, is is also being a. Uh, identified here and uh help me out alex where do i get from here to the antigena you do this way more often than i do <laughs> i thought uh, you were looking at our stuff for a second so, so we have somebody in our organization named maria flores <laughs> <laughs> really <laughs> yeah that, that's amazing um i think if you went to uh this example i don't know if they have the actual showing visually when antigena steps in um, but if you, mm, I'm trying to think which one, you'd have to scroll uh, to the right on the threat tray, I think, to get to, if you go to uh, overall score, if you switch back to, um, ah, here we go. So we want the model breaches highest score? Yes. And then you scroll all the way to the right. There should be, I've got uh, my user bar blocking uh, what to see here. Let me see. Uh, that's funny. I, I, I hate Max. All right. Actually, if you can pull all the way to the right again, I'll pick it up. I just moved it. Okay. Uh, so it is the one that's the two. Yeah, right there. 
the SMB directory. Math control. device SMB. There we, there we go. Yeah, and I, then if you click the magnifying glass on the top, there yeah, we go. bottom reach. And then if you let it play out, you'll you'll see the uh, antigen action in there. Okay. So they're doing something in the background. The demo god's angry. <laughs> I'm not missing it, am I? <laughs> no, you'll be there able to go. you'll be able to click play. Um, yeah, I should have been able to click play. Let me get rid of the uh, AI analyst view. So if we look at here, and then I can get rid of this as well, right? Yep. And then we can just let it. I need to go back a little bit. Yep. So I want to fast forward it up. Yeah. Uh, hmm. This might be, I'm not sure exactly what time it happens at. So in theory, what we're going to see here is just the traffic going between the devices and so, so, so what would nice little go. video version of it. Okay. So, so if we look at here, right, we can see the, the actions directly here, which, which have been taken, right? But yeah, yeah. There's, normally, there's normally a video to it, but I, I, it's being a bit laggy, to be honest with you. I'm not sure if it's my connection. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if it, that's okay. I can't imagine an analyst spends a lot of time watching those videos. He's going to look at this, this <laughs> log. You're right. But, but when, they're, so when they're trying to explain that to, let's say someone else in the that's business, an executive level, he's not yeah. going to understand like exactly. what this log means. This that's is exactly. essentially the audit trail in front of you right here. And the video gives a really good visual representation of exactly. what you, transpired. Exactly, yeah. that, that, that's correct. Yeah, but it's, it seems to be a little bit um said it's a little bit laggy in the moment. It, it's uh, I'm not sure if it's all of the connection on my end because I have a lot of stuff open right now with PowerPoint. And <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you can see the actions here, and it basically it blocked the connection to vary to SSH. It blocked the connection to Windows file sharing. It did this at various points because, of course, the malware keeps reactivating as well. That's the interesting yeah. thing. It'll go into hibernation mode and then try to do something else. Oftentimes, something completely different as well. That that's the other aspect, right? Um, when we look at completely different, for example, it we've seen it before where we'll try to connect to 10 or, or 11 different external hosts to try to put data up. And we have to, of course, be able to block them all. But you can see it by the speed it's doing it, by the fact that it keeps changing it, which is suspicious in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah, no human being can can hit that many devices that quickly and it's not going to be changing the direction in which they're trying to connect that quickly. Yeah. Only a port yeah. scanner or an automated script could do something like that. Absolutely. And, and I think that that's the interesting, but it's just one of these things where um, it, it, generally you, you uh, there you go. Yeah, there's always an anomaly, right? Always an anomaly. It is how I would say it. Right. It's playing. I hope you can see it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's a connection, and of course, it's already basically being blocked. It's not going any further, right? Yep. And you get extra kudo points for doing it live on a presentation. There you go. We <laughs> yeah. So at any every single time we try to pull up our, our BI board and do a, a, a presentation, it used to be we would never even attempt it because there's like the risk of it going sideways was too high. <laughs> it, it, it's just one of these things when you give demos, you know, sometimes, uh, the more often you do it, the higher the chance that it's going to fail in one of them. This is a beautiful visualization. I'll, I'll, I'll give you kudos on that too. Awesome. I, I mean, I'm sure there's some, some, we have some YouTube videos online and stuff as well where, where you can see some of these things individually. Uh, but, um, you know, I hope it was interesting. I hope you got a good overview. I hope it wasn't too salesy. And, uh, no, 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 it's not. No, it's great. It's it's great. You know, you have a good you have a good pitch and the technology itself is solid. It's cutting edge. It's you know, there's not really you can't really ask for more out of a product like this, to be honest with you. Um, you know, it's the kind of thing that like I think some of the big banking transaction companies have have been using like Bayesian and like statistical risk based stuff for a long time, but never with the machine learning and and very much relegated to the we know it works um, like like methodologies they don't they they generally don't like to do like the training methodology and kind of the, the deep learning kind of stuff has been my impression hmm. i was at i was at financial institutions for about you know 10 plus years of my career so i saw some of the similar kind of like security systems but never anything quite this cool um at any of them awesome i, I mean it, it is i'll be honest with you it's more complicated to convince people because you have to get them to switch the way that they think yeah, and and that's a that's a conversation, and so I guess we've uh, we get a we've we're used to the objections and the questions by now.
that's the interesting thing. There's a lot of practice in it, yeah. Um, so we got about four or five minutes. Does anybody on the line have any questions or commentary or anything that they're curious about that they want to talk about? Otherwise, I could easily fill up the next. Yeah, I have a question. So this is way. Um, so you're talking about the, the pattern of life. So actually, you build a bar for the people. So for example, if one people suddenly change to a, another part of life, that means the first couple of days, maybe these people will block by you open. Is that right? Um, could, could, could you repeat that last bit, please? So if somebody switches their cluster group, basically, they're going to get flagged. Right, and yeah. they might get blocked for a little while until it, it renormalizes. Huh. So, so, so essentially, it, so but it depends on how great the deviation is. And I can give you a practical example. When COVID hit and all of these companies moved to remote working. Well, that well, must have caused absolute havoc for you guys. No, because it didn't. Because what changed was one attribute, their location. They were still using the same services and everything. So it, bumps up, it bumps it up a little bit. But we don't just look at that one behavior change. So it's changing basically, uh, changing where you're going from and then changing other habits and behaviors different to all of the other users who did the same. Yeah. 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 And no, so no, no, that's great. That's another, great. Another layer have, to, to compare. Explains with. why the internet didn't just stop working when everybody switched to work from home. I, I would have expected, you know, and, and it's something that hadn't even occurred to me literally until you said it, but it's one of those things that I would have, you know, if somebody asked me if, if this is going to like screw up security, Was that? Back? Yeah, my microphone died there for a second. So yeah, I would have I would have said that this is gonna like you know the security software is gonna go nuts on all this, but 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 yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, it, it, it's a good question. A, you know, we use this internally. If we blocked our executives, <laughs> <laughs> we have we have the hardest test bed. You also have the advantage that they at least you know conceptually understand what your software does. So. <laughs> and I said, and it's being, I would say, we don't try to do the response zealously, overzealously. Yeah. We're, 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 there are certain things where we know we can do it. There's other things where we're a little bit more, even from an advice point of view, to say that, look, maybe put this into human confirmation mode and maybe maybe adjust it a little bit, make sure you have your whitelist populated and so on. Um, yeah. But, but it, the other aspect, of course, is that something might be abnormal for a short while. And unlike most traditional security tools, you don't have to tune them away. If you wait and the machine learns, okay, there's been a bit of a change in behavior, the threshold will go down, back down again. Yeah, yeah. Always, always based on the fact that it's, it's comparing it to other clusters, to other other different behaviors. Yeah, it gets desensitized essentially yeah. to it. Exactly. Does that open up a risk from a security perspective though, right? If an agent came in, could it desensitize just slowly, you know, like the, the frog in a boiling pot of water like slowly just turn the temperature up on the system you know so that the you know the the system itself which is based on statistical risk based it sees okay well this is a little bit out of normal but it's not that big deal and it keeps rebaselining until the point where this well, thing that's gets offensive. Through. yeah we call it adversarial or offensive ai and it's i'd be honest that's what keeps us up at night but we have a lab working yeah. on it in, yeah, in yeah, essence you, you would need to have a system similar to ours with the same hardware, with the same sophistication of models and so on, um, just to be able to analyze the data, to be able to work out how to beat our machine. Yeah. Your math let's be let's, let's be real. Most most now. criminals are lazy, right? Yes. So they're they're going to go after an easier target probably before they try to do something like that. Yeah, it, indeed. I, I would say that. Look, we're we're not there yet, right? We know that there's yeah. stuff in the lab, there's stuff in academia. DARPA Grand Challenge 2016, yeah. mailbird machines that hack each other, but they're not out of a lab. They require a huge amount of maintenance and hardware. It's not yeah. a piece of code. It's it's a whole system, right, with hardware and everything. I think that's where it mitigates it a little bit. Um, but but uh, I would say it's it's theoretically possible, but it's not practically feasible in the moment. Yeah. All right. Cool. Awesome. Well, there are hours up. So if, if, uh, if we have any follow up questions or anything, I'll I'll send them over to you guys and um, and I'll post this online so that you guys can share it or, or whatnot, review it. And um, 
you know, I'm going to encourage my security guys internally to kind of like watch this so that they can get an idea. Cause we've got obviously our own security and infrastructure team internally. And, and uh, yeah, this has been really fascinating. I really appreciate you guys joining. Awesome. Thanks for setting it up, Alex. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you having us on and Oliver. Thank you for uh, thank you, uh, Oliver. Yeah. If you guys ever need anything, feel free to give me a call or shoot me a message. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. I hope you guys found it interesting. Yeah. Good job. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.